From Peter the Great to Vladimir Putin, Russian leaders have attempted to modernize and mold the nation's judicial system. But legal and political experts say that time after time, they've undermined the system by using it to wage war on their political opponents. When they really care about something, they have no trouble using the law as a blunt instrument, forbidding criticism of the war, um, forbidding people from gathering in, 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 in numbers on the street. All those kinds of things are very, very crude instruments. Charges like espionage and treason are among the most powerful weapons. In recent years, former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan, basketball player Brittany Griner, and Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich have all been swept up by the Russian legal system. The Russian criminal justice system is incredibly sticky. Once you're in, it's very, very hard to get out. While Griner was released last year in a prisoner exchange, Whelan is still imprisoned and considered wrongfully detained by the U.S. Gershkovich was detained in late March and accused of espionage. Both the U.S. government and the journal vehemently deny the allegation and have called for his immediate release. Here's a look at how Russia's courts have evolved, but why many of its features remain the same. Joseph Stalin presided over a period known as the Great Terror, where he used the law to eliminate opponents and consolidate power. There was a provision in the criminal code, and it was a crime of anti-Soviet behavior. And the problem was is that there was no crisp, clear definition of what anti-Soviet behavior was. And so it could be almost anything. Historians say millions of Soviet citizens were executed, died in labor camps, or were starved to death under Stalin. After Stalin's death, Soviet leaders like Nikita Khrushchev abandoned mass terror. He and the other people who were surrounding Stalin made a, a decision, you know, not written down anywhere, but a very clear decision that this kind of mass terror was not productive. But that didn't mean that political arrests were over. It just means that they no longer took place on a mass scale. Many trials were closed to the public. And although people who were arrested were allowed to have lawyers, those lawyers had to be approved by the KGB. When Mikhail Gorbachev came to power, he attempted to introduce reforms to the legal system. In 1989, Gorbachev changed the judicial selection process so that judges were no longer picked by the Communist Party. He also instituted a jury system for the most serious criminal cases. What he really wants is to fix the existing system. Now, he did this in a very, you know, uh, uh, kind of ham-handed way. It was destined to fail. It was under his watch that Nicholas Daniloff, a U.S. News and World Bureau chief, was arrested by the KGB and accused of espionage. Daniloff had fallen into a trap set by the KGB. Eventually, he was released in a prisoner exchange. After the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a rapid shift from a planned economy to a market economy. And Russia's first president, Boris Yeltsin, backed a revamp of the courts. This led to sweeping changes within the legal profession. Lawyers were free to start their own firms and specialize in certain areas of law. In 1991, a constitutional court was created. And in 1993, Russia adopted a constitution that became the cornerstone of the legal system. Judicial review was introduced for the first time, meaning the constitutional court had the power to declare acts of the legislative and executive branches to be unconstitutional. In 1996, Russia joined the Council of Europe, which gave Russians the right to appeal the decisions of their domestic courts to the European Court of Human Rights. However, Yeltsin still managed to go after opponents using the courts. But there was a major challenge in this era, wealthy oligarchs. The emergence of the oligarchs brings a whole element of big money into the courts, which is never, never helpful, right? Because um, uh, and, 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 in the Soviet period, it really wasn't that you would go in and monetarily bribe a judge. But in the 90s, that definitely happened. Yeltsin set the foundation for a division of powers approach in government, but his successor re-centralized power back to the Kremlin. In 2000, Vladimir Putin came to power as president of Russia. He forged ahead with new reforms and his supporters credited him with reigning in the power of oligarchs. He backed a new code of criminal procedure that on paper gave defendants the same rights as those in the West. However, old Soviet habits re-emerged under Putin. He passed legislation that consolidated more power in his hands. One law eliminated direct popular elections across the country and gave him the right to appoint regional leaders in Russia. 
if you control the legislature, then what is the law? The other thing that he, he gets very good at is returning to this idea of vague and overbroad laws. In 2012, the Russian punk rock band Pussy Riot was arrested for hooliganism after protesting Putin's growing power. They go back to a, a, a crime of, of hooliganism, which is just a, you know, who knows what that means, and it can mean anything. They were all eventually released. Then in 2020, Putin passed several constitutional amendments that consolidated even more power in his hands. Putin could dismiss the prime minister and prosecutor general whenever he wanted. Despite decades of efforts to evolve Russia's justice system, Putin has brought back authoritarian control and many of the elastic aspects of the Soviet era's justice system. We're back to this old Soviet trick of finding a, a, a eternally elastic law that you can just you know, can catch anybody. 